Nowadays, whenever you bring up Arcane Studio, the name Redfall will be mentioned. Then, the conversation ends with how that studio's implosion is a cautionary tale of corporate greed and audience disconnect. But there was a time when the name Arcane was associated with better things. Dishonored was the game that gave Arcane the reputation that it had for the last decade. Even by modern gaming standards, it still leaves many titles from AAA studios in the dust. Uh, though the bar is not that high to begin with, but you get my point. What was it that made Dishonored so unique? What was the secret ingredient that turned a 2012 game into a timeless classic? With more than 40 hours in the game, I think I have found the answer. So join me as we uncover the magic of Dishonored. When people think of Dishonored, the cool powers like Bend Time or Rat Swarm and the beautiful graphic always stand out first. And the huge hands, look at them, grippers! But there are plenty of games with great graphic and fancy gameplay that never really ascended to the same status, so there must be something that Dishonored did well but not obvious. It's the level design. No, seriously. Despite not being very in your face, the levels are the perfect sandbox for your memorable moments with the game. Being a linear game, Dishonored introduces you to multiple levels as you progress the story. Varying in locations and themes, the levels have two similarities. They're simple but huge. By simple, I mean it's incredibly intuitive to navigate through the levels. Doesn't matter where you are in the game, you can look around and clearly see where you can and can't go. If you can see it, you most likely can climb or blink on it. Arcane did this visual clarity so well, there wasn't a single moment in the game where my cool magical assassin couldn't climb an arbitrary ledge just because the game said so. And forget about the frustration of getting lost in an area for hours. The map have enough variation so no two corners look the same. There's no need for a mini-map to get around allowing you to fully immerse yourself in the experience. While being easy to navigate, each level is positively massive. Attention, citizens of Dunwall. The Lord Regent has ordered... I'm talking multiple areas per level, each with insane verticality. And this is the same for every single level. There will be some crazy tall tower and you will get to climb it. Remember the first time you took that elevator in Elden Ring thinking it was just some underground dungeon? Only for it to be a whole area underneath the surface? Yeah, dishonored levels are like that. The moment you start looking around, a whole new space the size of a Target parking lot opens up for you to explore. This is my unashamed attempt to appeal to my American viewers. Mwah, love you guys. It gets even better. Dishonored being an immersive sim means that these levels all have different paths you can take. That's standard practice for the genre, and the game absolutely nailed it. Whatever level you are at, you can always list off at least two approaches. The main entrance with the most resistance, The long way around with a different kind of headache or a whole different solution to your problem. And because of how intuitive the level design is, all these paths converge at multiple points, so at any moment you can change your strategy. Wanna raise some ruckus? You can start running in gun blazing. Too much fighting for your liking? You can disappear into the darkness in an instant. This flexibility is the true beauty of immersive sims. But if it's only that, Dishonored wouldn't necessarily have the reputation that it does now. Arcane set themselves apart from other studios by their obsession with small and minute details. Even for an immersive sims, it's still ridiculous. The first thing that grabs your eyes is the environment. Dunwall, the fictional city where the game takes place, is currently suffering from the worst plague outbreak in its recent history. All citizens, inspect your neighbors' faces closely. Once bleeding from the eyes occurs, death is inevitable. All suspicions of plague, regardless of severity, must be reported. The spy master, Hiram Burroughs, had an ingenious idea. My poverty eradication plan was meant to bring prosperity to the city. He would get rid of all the poor people in Dunwall with the rat plague. And it was a simple plan. Bring the disease-bearing rats from the Pandician continent and let them take care of the poor for us. Clearly, he was inspired after his trip to the country of Canada. But it gave me the chance to attack the plague with some real authority. Quarantines, deportation of the sick. We're just gonna kill them! And who would've thunk, some people broke quarantine. 
and then quarantine is broken. But you can see how my plan should have worked. By the time your character makes his way through the game, the plague has had six months to wreak havoc on Dunwall. As you play, you can see the catastrophic consequences of the disease on civilians. There's no hospital, I told you that. You think they round people up because there's a cure? They're city guards. <coughs> They're <coughs> supposed to protect people. In sealed off apartments, there are corpses of whole families with diary pages detailing their slow and painful demises. Buildings are either abandoned or used as mass grave because the city couldn't get rid of all the corpses of the plague victims. Those less fortunate became weepers, mindless wanderers that further spread the disease. But the game doesn't directly comment on this. Some NPCs will have dialogues about the dire situation, but there's no one-liners or quipping to take away the severity of reality. You are there, alone, to witness Dunwall's struggle for survival. As if that's not enough, you get to know the plague victims too. Their letters and diary pages scattered through the levels that gives you a glimpse into their lives and how the plague tore it apart. Some people tried to get away, and some chose to die with their loved ones. And you know what's crazy? All of these are perfectly blended into the background. Unless you pay attention to your surrounding, you will miss out on cool bits of lore that enhance the experience. Another aspect that really brought life to Dunwall is how the city reacts to your actions through your chaos meter. Now, we will discuss the system later, but no one can deny that it adds a nice layer of interactivity to the world. Many immersive sims rely on physics to let the audience engage directly with the game, but Designer doesn't put much emphasis on this. You can only pick up things like cups, bottles, and explosive oil tank. Instead, the game chose to focus on your playing tendencies. If you kill a lot of people, you will raise your chaos meter. This is an invisible metric that reflects your actions upon the world. With high chaos, there will be more rat swarms, more weepers, people will act way worse, and your allies will hate you as much as they hate the guy who killed your empress. Was that your intent? To spread the malady to us? No, friend. I tell you, I am well. Just think for a moment before you... But this interactivity doesn't just stop at combat. Some details in the environment also change depend on your chaos meter. Emily, your unconfirmed daughter, will draw a portrait of you as the game goes on. With high chaos, she will draw your mask, while on low chaos, it's your face. The wanted posters in the streets also change based on your chaos level. And there are thousands of these little details that make each playthrough very unique. The best thing is they're subtle. You won't notice them when they're there, but you will know when they're gone. So Arcane designed a very fun world that feels alive and reacts to your actions. What else can make it better? Oh right, it's freaking gorgeous. This game is beautiful in a timeless way. Each level has such a distinct color palette that at different time of day, the same location will have different feeling to it. The first time you arrive at the distillery district, the whole place feels like it's already dead and decaying. Speaking, it is with regret that I announce that my term as Lord Regent has been extended through the month of harvest. And Abandoned buildings, scattered corpses, and gang activities. It truly feels like a slum. We're wasting our time. How much could she have? She digs in trash for a living. Let's get a drink. I'm dry as an overseer's prick. In the next mission, you return to the district in daytime. Despite the vibrant color of the buildings, the lack of people gives this place an eerie atmosphere, something that's akin to a liminal space. Or the mission at the Boyle's Mansion, where you get to see one of the coolest contrasts in gaming. To contain the plague, entire streets were quarantined and left to dead. But here you are strolling into this scene. Careful. We tried for a peek upstairs and the man on duty is an ass. I should have taught him some manners. This party is a sham. I'm sure he's just doing his job. A party like this, anyone might have crept in. Excuse me. Just five minutes ago, you were dodging patrols on the empty street, and now you're at this lavish party where everyone acts as if the plague is just some minor inconvenience. The dying city outside makes this party even more brutally beautiful. But my favorite map is the flooded district. Just when you think the city can't get any deader than this, it got worse. 
The game doesn't specify when the dam broke, but it was close to when the plague started. As a result, the entire industrial district is left abandoned due to the flood. Many made it out in time, but some weren't as fortunate. The infected people who physically couldn't run away from the flood turned into sweepers, feeding on litter of trash to prolong their mindless, painful existence. But just next door to this is the base of Dowd and his band of assassins. They use weepers and river crust as natural defense for the hideout, something that makes sense, but is still really morbid. The entire level has this brownish green miasma over it that created this sick, rotten, and deadly atmosphere. Paired it with the tall, run-down buildings, and you have one of the most memorable area in video games. This reminds me of Ravenholm from Half-Life 2 due to how ruined the state of things are. Now for the more flashy stuff, the powers. I don't think there's anything I can say about the powers in Dishonored that hasn't been said before. They're fast, they're cool, and in any other game, they would just break it wide open. But somehow they work in the world of Dishonored. Before we go deeper, I have to clarify something. I find it really cool when a game allows me, knowingly or not, to skip a quest or even an entire area. Would I do it all the time? No, but I sure love the fact that I could. That's why I love the Dishonored gameplay, even when I'm doing a non-lethal low chaos run. Normally, the act of walking up to an enemy, press and hold a button and stash the body somewhere for a non-lethal run gets annoying really fast. But in Dishonored, it's not required that you have to take out the enemies. The map is so well designed, as stated above, that if you knew the game well enough, you could get to the whole level without even touching a guard, skipping the entire combat gameplay loop. And I think that's awesome! Of course you can also choose the slow approach of sleep dart and choking, and you have just as good a time. Now the majority of powers you have are for murdering people, and boy they're really satisfying to use. There's a reason Stealth Gamer VR is where they are today. But these powers don't necessarily take away from the non-lethal playstyle, rather they offer a different experience. Trust me, I've made an entire video bitching about a grappling hook. I will know when a game gives me an ultimatum between enjoying it and saving my time. But with Dishonored, lethal and non-lethal can be equally engaging by the virtue of them being almost two different games. The powers are so broken they loop right back into being somewhat balanced. Alright, now the controversial stuff. Let's talk about the chaos system. Narratively, it makes perfect sense. Killing is like letting loose, so it's easy and the consequences are clear. More corpses mean more food for rats and so on, you get the idea. But as a gameplay system, it's kind of rigid. I'm indifferent to it, as I play the game as a stealth game most of the time, but many people feel like they are being punished by the chaos system. The game gives you all these cool options to murder people, but then punishes you for it by, you know, giving you the bad ending. While the non-lethal option is just choke, sleep dart, or leg it out of there. I think we just have to conclude that it's not the best feature. It does well enriching the environment, but also throws a curveball at the gameplay loop. It's given an overwork in Dishonored 2 and it feels much fairer. But for a 2012 game, I think it was an incredible innovation. If we look at the individual components of the game, it's already incredible, but put together, these systems form such a mesmerizing experience. When I play the game, I feel like I'm being lulled into a trance by the game's rhythm. Dishonored is more than the sum of its parts, and I think Arcane really captured lightning in a steampunk bottle. And that's the magic of Dishonored. You'd made it this far, love you. Choke that like button if you enjoyed the video, thank you for watching, and bye!